Hey everybody, Aaron Cowan, Sage Dynamics. Uh, what you're about to watch is a preview of the Sage Dynamics Vehicle Self-Defense Handgun class. Uh, just like with any other video, this is a training supplement, it's not a training replacement. What I wanted to do is put a video out there, a preview of what you can expect, just some of the content of how Sage Dynamics runs our vehicle self-defense classes for the handgun. All right, good morning. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, or I, I think I shook everybody's hand except for the people who showed up late. What's up, dude? Good to see you again. Um, this is vehicle self-defense handgun. The whole premise of this course is defending yourself inside a vehicle or immediately outside of a vehicle using a handgun. It is a CCW focused class because the two places we usually feel most comfortable is in our home and in our car. And for some of us, that's where we spend most of our time. I spend pretty much just as much time in my truck as I do in my house, sometimes a little more. Because we usually driving to places that we're familiar with, we get complacent. Getting complacent is very easy to do. We just stop paying attention. If you've driven somewhere a hundred times, how often do you drive there and just don't remember the trip? Were you even really paying attention? We're all guilty of it. Everyone here has done it. I do it. It's realizing it, being able to snap out of it. Because if something happens and you have to fight from the vehicle, there's some very specific circumstances and some very specific problems that take place working inside of a vehicle that don't exist in just an out in the open or a pedestrian self-defense kind of situation or even a home defense kind of situation. This car has some very unique advantages, but it's got even more disadvantages based on how the situation presents. 100,000 possible variables can go into any self-defense shooting, so we can't really predict what's gonna happen, but we can look at the constants. And we can look at how you react to a threat if you're threatened inside a car or immediately around a car. Um, we are all very, very good at exceeding the standards we set for ourselves. But in this class, I'm setting the standards. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I'll only be able to shoot out of vehicles a couple times a year. Some of you standing here will only be able to do it. This is it. This will probably be the only time you do it this year, yeah? So take this shit very seriously. And I know it's going to be cool. We're going to be punching glass. It's going to be awesome. But your performance standards are going to be dependent on how much you put into your shooting ability. If you want to run the gun as fast as you can, great, but I expect you to shoot only as fast as you can accurately get hits. Some of the, start, the targets are going to be static to start, but we're going to get into movers later on in the day, and that's really going to push your performance envelope when it comes to fire discipline. Don't take shots you're not sure you can't get. Now, it's not going to be dynamic, and it's not going to be combat roles, and it's not going to be anything like that. I'm going to make this class as realistic as I can. What I expect from you guys as those attending this class is to put everything you got into it, Take it completely seriously. Let's not ruin our downtime. Let's maximize the time we have available because it's your guys' time. You know, I don't, I'll be out here all day anyway doing whatever because I love being on the range. It's my second home. But you guys can't get this time back. So if you don't maximize this eight or nine hours of training, you're, you're, you're basically, uh, it's on you. It really is. So let's maximize this time, keep things quick, and really pay attention to how to increase your performance ability throughout the day. Make sense? Everybody on board with it? Cool. Light up! Now we're gonna talk about the car. Um, generally speaking, everybody's gonna be driving the car, right? Now we could have a self-defense situation where we're riding shotgun, maybe. Like the girlfriend's driving, the wife's driving, something like that where we have to recognize and engage the threat and we'll get into that later but the main premise of this class is if you have to use force because if I don't have to use force I can just drive away right so every drill that I put you through the context will be unless I say differently you have no immediate means of escape in the vehicle the vehicle you're not able for whatever reason to drive away if you can drive away drive away if you can use the car as a weapon use the car as a weapon 
So unless I say otherwise, the premise is you have no immediate means of escape. You may be able to find a way to escape in a near future, but immediately you have to defend your life or the lives of your loved ones. Make sense? So now everybody's on the same page as far as context is concerned. Awesome. Um, as far as working the gun inside the car, the biggest difference between shooting from in here and shooting standing out here is compression and you are limited by the vehicle frame itself on how mobile you can be immediately. It's really hard to maneuver in these driver's seats. Now, barring a reason not to, we want to fight our way out of the vehicle because the vehicle can't move. For whatever reason, say the vehicle can't move. I've got a car in front of me, a car behind me, I've got a sidewalk and trees off to my left, I've got a suicide lane to the right or another lane of traffic, I've got nowhere to go. So I have to fight my way out of the vehicle. Now, say I have a wife and kids in the vehicle, would I still exit the vehicle? I would. Absolutely. I don't want to leave the vehicle, but I want to draw fire away from the cabin. And that's, that's a really hard thing to get, peop, get in people's minds is if you've got a kid in the car seat in the back, you don't want to leave the kid, and I completely understand that. But the, you are the threat. Bad guys will practice self-defense the same way we will. If he's coming up and he's trying to carjack you or he's trying to, you know, like, give me your money, give me your wallet, whatever the situation may be, as soon as you present your weapon, it becomes self-defense for him as well because he doesn't want to get shot either. The difference between him and us is he's going to shoot, he's just going to start shooting with no fire discrimination whatsoever. Whereas you, hopefully, will be judicious in your uh, application of strong sedatives to his body. We want to put this guy down, but the longer we stay here, the more we potentially endanger those people inside the vehicle who can't defend themselves. Ideally, the situation would take place when you're by yourself. That'd be ideal. Uh, but we want to get mobility as quick as we can, and we also want to draw fire away from our loved ones if we can. And all things being equal, and they never are, the situation may be over before you're able to actually exit the vehicle, or before it's prudent to exit the vehicle. Uh, but we have to be prepared and we have to know the proper techniques and we have to be able to perform under some level of stress to know what we're competent in getting out of the vehicle as soon as we can. If the situation warrants it or if it makes sense to exit the vehicle, we want to do that as fast as we can. Make sense? Awesome. So where should my muzzle be as I exit the vehicle? Just, just as I'm getting out of the car. How can I avoid, because let's, let's be honest, if this happens on a rural road and I've got woods all around me, the muzzle can be anywhere, right? Mm -hmm. But if I'm getting out of a vehicle in, tra in, a tr in traffic, in a city, on a residential street, I've got houses, I've got cars, I've got people, I've got some guy filming for World Star, like I've got all these potentially innocent people or actually innocent people all around me. And just because I can't see them doesn't mean they're not there. If I'm on a residential street and there's a house right here and I can see the big bay window in the living room, do I want to point my gun in that house if I can avoid it? So what is the safest known direction? I've got two. Down or up. Down or up. Down is actually less safe because of ricochet concerns. Ricochets can kill just as easy as a live ram can. And a ricochet can disable me. Now I'm not saying you're going to have an ND, but if you do have an ND... Even if it hits the pavement, it may spall into your feet. Yeah. And that's happened. So as controversial as it is, safe isn't up to, is, this, is, this is a safe direction. This is called temple index. Now, it doesn't make as much sense contextually, con, yeah, outside of the vehicle as it does inside the vehicle, which we'll get to. But for the purposes of right now, as soon as I exit the vehicle, bad guy's down, okay, he's good, I need to move. I don't know any of this. Come straight around, meter off the car, and now I can move to the rear of the vehicle or wherever my destination is. all that. I have a passenger. Does that complicate things a little bit? Do we normally drive around by ourselves? Some of us do, some of us don't. If I have to engage a threat, even if he carries a gun, I recognize the threat. Do I have time to talk to him about it? He will know something's going on when that gun comes out. And then he'll start searching on his own to find it. Now, I may give him verbals like threat, 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 gun, 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 gun strawberry whatever your code word is going to be and you should have some kind of communication built up with the people you normally travel with especially if they carry guns but let's say the threat presents from the front right of the vehicle the guy's about to climb on the hood or he's got a gun or whatever the situation is come out i can bang 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 i don't really have to worry about him because he can't get in front of the gun right but let's say the threat presents at his window what do i do then now as a left-handed shooter i kind of have it made you'll want to see this because 
I can protect him and still run the gun 100% effectively because all I have to do is pin him back and push past. Make sense? Now, what do I have to do as a right-handed shooter? I have to either cross block, which I don't like because it's just hard to do. Um, and if it's hard to do, you're probably not going to do it. You can if you're trained to the proficiency. Or I can block him with the same arm as the gun. Or I just don't touch him at all and I press the muzzle completely past him. So it'd be straight out and I'm going to try to shoulder into him. Hopefully, he's compliant, everything's okay. He's a little upset that he's got brass in his face and he can't hear, but I just saved his life and saved my life, so we should be okay. We should still be bros. What if the threat's at the rear right window? How do I get this muzzle back there safely? Push me forward. I've got two, well, temple index. I've got two options. One is, one is the puzzle. Nobody wants to do the fucking puzzle, because the puzzle is gun out, dashboard, center console, and now, I got in, now I'm in the back seat. Does that take time? You know, it's much easier. That's different if you're a right-handed shooter, though. It's, you still got to do the puzzle. So, let's just do it right-handed, because most people are right-handed. So, I was right-handed. Gun comes up. I got to get back there. So, I can dashboard, center console, rear a vehicle, right? That's one option. Or, I can just put it to the side of my head, turn my head, and shoot this fucking guy. Which one's faster? It's just so much easier. And, like, I don't understand the resistance to it. It's literally this, 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 versus this. Now, granted, I can do that pretty fast, but it's a lot of moving parts. And I don't want that many moving parts in my weapon presentation. Think I want it. to... If you've got a kid in the back seat, you can't go through. Yeah, exactly. Not... No, your seat, add, let's add passengers. What if i got a kid in a car seat? Now, a full-grown adult, I can be like, move, or I can reach back there and pull him out of the way, or whatever i got to do. But if i got a kid in a car seat, little feet kicking, like... I have, I can't move them in time. So do I want to come, do I want to bring my gun into the threat, raising the muzzle or bringing it down over the top of the kid in the car seat? Make sense? It, it's, there's not much rocket science to it. Is anybody here uncomfortable with it? And you're all going to see the context once we start running drills, which we're going to do very, very Fire Does a moving threat make life more difficult? Yeah. Yes. Does that increase the realism of what we're doing here? Yes. Absolutely. Now, obviously, it'd be easier to just set up target stands and be like, yeah, this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy. What Josh just did that I really liked is he had one threat with a gun and one threat with a knife. Who got all the attention initially? Gun. The guy with the gun. Why? Because he can with, shoot. Yeah, guy with the knife has the guy with the it. knife has to gain access to the vehicle before he can do anything with it. Now, is it gonna is it realistic that you'd have one guy with a gun, one guy with a knife? I don't know. But the guy with the gun, in most situations, should take precedence because he's the larger threat. Now, if the guy with the knife is like right here, and the guy with the gun's over there, who gets shot first? Uh, guy with the knife. Because he's got to physically touch us with it to hurt hurt us. The guy with the gun just has to aim at us. So what Josh did is he ventilated the guy with the gun, and then when the guy with the knife tried to come through the passenger window, that's when he started getting fed.
So, as the round punches through that window, it's hitting this kind of angle, right? So the round's like that. So what's it most likely to do? Deflect down. Whereas rounds coming into the windshield, they're hitting an angle like this. So what are they most likely to do? Deflect up. No science, no way to accurately predict what the bullet's gonna do, but that's what's most likely to happen. So if we have to shoot through the windshield, that first round's gonna spider it out and it's going to block our sight picture. If we're using our sights, it's gonna block our sight picture. So we're gonna have a natural desire to move the gun. And then we're just gonna have the same problem over and over and over again. Because every shot is gonna be, it's gonna be clean to start, but as soon as you fire, it's gonna punch that glass and it's gonna make you move the gun again. So what you wanna do is drill a hole through that windshield. You wanna just gun it up. Now, if you can consciously move the gun just a little bit inside your acceptable area of accuracy on your bad guy, if he's dumb enough to stand there and let you do that for seven or eight rounds, that's fine. But let's just go ahead and go with an, a, what I would consider an eye-hand coordination sight pitcher. I see bad guy. I see desired point of impact. I'm going to fire as many rounds as I can into that area. I know where he's at, and as long as he's still there, I can still hit him. As soon as he moves, I can stop firing or adjust fire or whatever I have to do, but those first rounds, I want to hit him with every single one of them I can. Hopefully, that amount of fire will open up a really good sight picture in the windshield if I need to continue to use it. Now, once I've fired my engagement, I'm going to start getting out of this vehicle, right? So once I get out here, can I shoot through this V? Can I brace off the car if I need a more accurate shooting platform? One thing to be concerned about, though, is if he's shooting back, and we'll demo this later, and his rounds are impacting this windshield, those rounds do spall a little bit. So if I press my hand straight out like this, I might be catching some of that shit in my arms. So ideally, I want to avoid, and on cars, it's uncomfortable to do anyway, unless you're seated. If you're standing, it's really uncomfortable to do this. You can still do it, because who cares? If that's what you got to do, that's what you got to do. But I want to try to avoid doing that, because if, if the windshield's getting hit with rounds, and let's be honest, this guy might not be the best shot in the world, we hope he's not, Hopefully his rounds are hitting all around us and not hitting us. There's a really good chance for spalling off that windshield. And he's probably, I can't say definitively, but he's probably not shooting really quality researched vetted ammunition. He's probably shooting what was in the gun when he got it. Or maybe he knows a lot. Maybe he's on that internet checking out them hydroshocks and them rip rounds. And... Well, I mean, I'd like, it, honestly, I'd rather him shoot at me with rip rounds than anything else. But uh, Yeah, I was going to say, we're 45. Well, then he's just going to blow the car completely out from, I'm going to, like, the door's going to take me out. And, yeah. Like, knock you to your ass. He's going to blow a hole in the world. We'll kind of go past it, because everybody knows, more or less, the engine's going to stop most rounds that are shot at you. And we talked earlier this morning about what else is covered on the body of the car. We identified some things, didn't we? Now, let's talk about these pillars. Can the pillars stop incoming fire? This isn't a lot of real estate. Looks like one went through right on the outer edge. But if you look, the closer you get to the windshield, there's the round right there. And that's 147 grain gold dot. Now granted, anecdotal, because I'm only using one type of ammunition. Some ammunition may perform better than others. But with handguns, it's gonna be marginally better or marginally worse, or really worse, in the case of some of your exotic boutique ammunition that's out there. Um, some rounds are designed to do work really well against flesh, but when they shoot barriers, their performance drops significantly. Um, there's a lot of older rounds out there, first generation hollow points, they work really well against the body, or pretty well against flesh, but any kind of barrier, and especially car body stuff, and they just completely lose their effectiveness. Huh. That's crazy, right? How many went through? Looks like we got one skipper. No, it's in there. Yeah, it didn't even go through. Yeah. Huh. Man, boom. Wild, right? Holy shit. Um, when I first found this out, I was like, no. And then I went and shot a car and I was like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Uh, yeah, I was. Depending on the car type, you might not have a C pillar. You know what I mean? Some cars don't have them. This car has one, but it also has this vanity window. So do you think that's gonna affect the effectiveness of the round? Well, before we shoot it, let's take a look at what we got. We've still got those strong frame supports and this crush pillar still has to be there. But is it gonna be as strong as say that B pillar is? Maybe, maybe not, let's find out.
pump. That bolt's still in there. That guy went through. Yeah, because I missed the pillar. That one's in, but I don't think it came it out. Through. Yeah. So I got one, two that went completely through. These went into the actual vehicle chassis, so that wouldn't be a big of an issue. Uh, but as you can see, it's not always, oh, look at that. Um, it's not always clear cut, no pun intended. Um, based on the pillar design itself, the pillar may or may not stop incoming fire. I'm always gonna depend on that B pillar. The A pillar, I'm a little iffy about. As you can see, it's very easy for a round to get in there, but this is a lot of wide coverage here. This whole area is gonna stop fire. In fact, I'm gonna put a couple rounds right here right now. Nope, they're in there and they're staying in there. All right, I'm gonna go C pillar on this one. Obviously that green tip is right through here. Deviated seriously though. Check Ooh. out this deviation. Wow. Yeah. Impressive. That didn't deviate much at all, but look at that look at that exit wound, man. That's the shit 45 mess are made of. <laughs> See the AK do that to bone. Yeah. So up first, we'll run this whole magazine in 124s, the hydro shock, and I'm just going to kind of move it around. Let's see if we had any enter the cap. Be shooting around, see what I can get. Fan that off. Not vehicle bodies. They say, oh, that won't stop bullets. It may, it may not. But nothing is 100% either way, except for glass. Glass usually doesn't stop bullets. But still, it's still usual. Now, obviously, I couldn't put all the class content into the video because it would be nine hours long. But it gives you a really good idea of how I stress realism in every single class, how I want to approach it. I want training to be as realistic as possible. I want to produce problem solvers and thinkers, not just mindless shooters. I don't like to uh, script things to such a degree that it's going to be as, as safe as possible because safety is important. But I want things to be as realistic as possible. So if you plan on attending to Sage Dynamics, the vehicle self-defense handgun or vehicle self-defense rifle, this will give you a really good idea of what you can expect and the level of training and the level of realism, um, just from what I've been able to show you in this preview, uh, that I produce from the Sage Dynamics courses. I'm Aaron Karen with Sage Dynamics. Train accordingly.